DNA, just mechanisms of storing information, RNA, DNA. Yeah. How big of an invention was that? That seems to be you. That seems to be fundamental to uh, like something deep within what life is, is the ability, as you said, to kind of store and propagate information. But then you also kind of inferred that with your and your students' work that there's a deep connection between the chemistry and the ability uh, to have this kind of genetic information. So how big of an invention is, is it to have a nice representation, a nice hard drive for info to pass on? Huge, I suspect. Uh, I mean, but when I was talking about the code, you see the code in RNA as well. Uh, and RNA almost certainly came first. Um, and, and there's been a, an, an idea going back decades called the RNA world because RNA, in theory, can copy itself and can catalyze reactions. So it kind of cuts out this chicken and egg loop. So DNA, it's possible, is not that special. So R RNA, RNA is the thing that does the work, really. Uh, and the code lies in RNA. The code lies in the interactions between RNA and amino acids. And it still is there today in the ribosome, for example, which is just kind of a giant ribozyme, which is to say it's an enzyme that's made of, uh, of RNA. Um, so getting to RNA, I suspect, is probably not that hard. But getting from RNA, how do you, uh, you know, there's multiple different types of RNA now. How do, how do, how do you distinguish? This is something we're actively thinking about. How do you distinguish between, you know, a random population of RNAs? Some of them go on to become messenger RNA. That, this is the, the 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 transcript of the code of the gene that you you want to make. Some of them become uh, transfer RNA, which is which is this kind of the unit that holds the amino acid that's going to be poly polymerized. Some of them become uh, ribosomal RNA, which is the machine which is joining them all up together. How do they? discriminate themselves and, and, and you know there's some kind of phase transition going on there what's uh, i don't know it's a difficult question and we're now in the region of biology where information is coming in but the thing about rna is very very good at what it does but the largest genomes supported by rna are rna viruses like hiv for example they're pretty small um and and so there's a limit to how complex life could be unless you come up with dna which chemically is a really small change but how easy it is to make that change, I don't really know. As soon as you've got DNA, then you've got a, an amazingly stable molecule for information storage, um, and you can do absolutely anything. But how likely that transition from RNA to DNA was, I don't know either. How much possibility is there for variety in uh, ways to store information? Because it seems to be very, there's specific characteristics about the, the programming language of DNA. Yeah, there's a lot of work going on on what's called Zeno DNA or, or RNA. Can we replace the the bases themselves, the the letters, if you like, in 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 RNA or DNA? Can we replace the backbone? Can we replace, for example, phosphate with arsenate? Uh, can we replace the sugar ribose or deoxyribose with a different sugar? And the answer is yes, you can, um, within limits. There's not an infinite space there. Arsenate doesn't really work if the bonds are not as strong as phosphate. It's probably quite hard to replace phosphate. Um, it's possible to do it. The question to me is, why is it this way? Right. Is it because there was some form of selection that this is better than the other forms and there were lots of competing forms of information storage early on and this one was the one that worked out? Or was it kind of channeled that way that these are the molecules that you're dealing with um, and, and, and they work. Uh, and I'm increasingly thinking it's that way that we're channeled towards ribose, phosphate, and, 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 and the bases that are used. But there are, you know, 200 different letters kicking around out there that could have been used. It's such an interesting question. If you look at, in the programming world in, in computer science, there's a programming language called JavaScript, yeah. which was uh, written super quickly. It's a giant mess, <laughs> but it took over the world. And it was kind Sounds of sounds very biological. It, it was it, it was kind of a running joke that like um, like surely this can't be the this is a terrible programming language. It's a giant mess. It's full of bugs. It's so easy to write really crappy code, but it took over all of front end development in the web browser. If you have any kind of dynamic interactive website, it has it's usually running JavaScript. And it's now taking over much of the back end, which is like the serious heavy duty computational stuff. And it's become super fast with the different compilation engines 
um, that are running it. So it's like, it really took over the world. It's very possible that this initially crappy, uh, derided language actually takes everything over. And then the question is, did human civilization always strive towards JavaScript? <laughs> or was JavaScript just the first programming language that ran in the browser and still sticky? The first, the first is the sticky one. And so it wins over anything else because it was first. And that we, I don't think that's answerable, right? But it's good to yeah. ask that. I suppose in the lab, uh, you can't, you can't uh, run it with programming languages, but in biology you can probably do some kind of um, small scale evolutionary test to try to infer which which is which. Yeah, I mean, in, in a way, we've we've got the hardware and the software here, and and the the, the hardware is maybe the, the DNA and the RNA itself, and then the software perhaps is more about the code. Is did the code have to be this way? Could it have been a different way? Yeah. Um, people talk about the optimization of the code, and there's some suggestion for that. Uh, I think it's weak, actually. But you could imagine you could come out with a million different codes, and, and this would be one of the best ones. Yeah. Um, well, we don't know this. Well, we people, know this. I mean, people have tried to model it based on the effect that mutations would have. Ah. Um, so, no, you're right. We don't know it because that's a sing that's a single assumption that a mutation is is what's being selected on there. And there's other possibilities too. I mean, there does seem to be a resilience and a redundancy to the whole thing. Yeah. It's hard to mess up. In, in, in the way you mess it up often is likely to produce interesting results. So it's... Um, Are you talking about JavaScript or the genetic code now? Both. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I mean, it's almost, uh, you know, biology is underpinned by this kind of mess as well. Yeah. When you look at the human genome and it's full of stuff that is really either broken or dysfunctional or was a virus once, whatever it may be, and somehow it works. And maybe we need a lot of this mess. You know, we know that some functional genes are taken from this mess. 